Jesus, 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 as your sons and daughters, we confess that we don't fully believe the gospel. We sing it, we say it, we underline it, but Lord, for so many of us, there's a stubborn corner of our hearts when we wonder how in the world a perfect God like you could really be so enamored with a mess like us. Lord Jesus, thank you that when you ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of God, our creator, redeemer, you did not leave us as orphans. You left us your Holy Spirit and you left us this love letter called the Bible. We pray this morning you would use both your, st- your spirit and your word to open our eyes wider to the miracle of being perfectly, unconditionally loved by you. Thank you that you know us completely and you choose to love us unconditionally. Amen and amen. Before we dive in, you can turn to Luke 5. I wanna say something to the parents. I've heard some peanuts fussing. I became a mom at 50 through the miracle of adoption. Went through menopause and motherhood at the same time. Um, My baby is 12. She's at belonging kids. The fact that I was so broken when I was younger, I just totally sabotaged my shot at being a mom. And then I was really drawn to abusive men. So my husband is still lost and won't stop to ask for directions. The fact that he redeemed my story and allowed me to become a mother of this amazing pumpkin whose first mama died in Haiti. I'm just, I'm undone by parenthood. And so when I hear babies fussing in church, that sounds like a miracle to me. That might as well be angel's wings. And so when I see some Christian woman with a quilted Bible cover shoot a dirty look at a young mama with a kid, I'm like, I'm gonna pray she gets hives. So do not worry. If you hear a baby around you, that is a miracle. Speaking of miracles, turn to Luke chapter five. Luke chapter five. I love Luke's gospel. We've got four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, The word gospel comes from the Greek word euangelion. It means the good news. And Luke is the only non-Jewish author of scripture. So he wrote a gospel account, and that is, that is basically just a brick and mortar account of the earthly life and ministry of Jesus Christ. He also wrote the Acts of the Apostles. He's the only non-Jewish author of scripture. So he knew what it was to be an outsider. His, his books are incredibly detailed. He was a physician. They're also very, very inclusive. He gets what it is to feel like you're not good enough to be perfectly loved by God. Also, for those of you who are reading through the Bible in a year. I always burn out around Leviticus, but if you make it to the New Testament, (laughs) skip over the gospel according to John, because when they canonize scripture, that's just a fancy word that means when they collated it, they put Matthew as the first gospel. It's really not. Mark was actually the first chronological gospel, but then they inserted John between Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. He actually wrote those together as a seamless document. And so when you get to the end of Luke, go straight to the Acts of the apostles. Come back later for John. But if you read Luke's writing together, goodness gracious, y'all, the redemptive symmetry is just absolutely amazing. Luke chapter five, verse one, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him, and of course, Dr. Luke's talking about Jesus here, to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, master, we toiled all night and we took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to the partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So this is the very beginning of Pete's vocational ministry with Jesus Christ. Peter was a fisherman before he became a disciple. Anybody remember what he fished for? Y'all can talk back. I'm not your pastor. Anybody remember the type of fish? Tilapia. 
We would call it tilapia today in the States. They call it St. Peter's fish in Israel. And he was a cast net fisherman. Because if you know anything about tilapia, you know tilapia go down into the cool of the lake. He's fishing at Lake Gennesaret. That's also the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias, also called one other name. It has four titles, same body of water. And it's not a sea at all. It's kind of like Percy Priest. I've spent a month in Israel. It's about nine miles long, about seven miles wide. It's not a salt water lake. It's a freshwater lake, tilapia, freshwater fish. They will go down into the bottom of the lake during the day. Israel's in the Middle East. It's hot during the day. Well, fishermen who are fishing for tilapia, they'll put out their boats. They have these flat sides on their boat. The boats are flat bottom. The sides are only, I don't know, 18, 24 inches high. Now, if you ever get the chance to go to Israel, you will have a gentleman tell you this is the boat Jesus fished from. That's a lie. It <laughs> doesn't exist, but it's a replica. And so flat bottom boats, kind of a, a knee high wall. And then they would hang oil lanterns on the perimeter of the boat. And when the sun went down, insects will gather around those oil lanterns and the tilapia will come up from the bottom of the lake to feed on those insects. And that's when the fishermen would take cast nets and throw them over the edge of the boat so they weren't Brad Pitt, a river runs through it. I fell in love with him in that movie. They were not fly fishermen, not bass fishermen. They used nets. So they would throw the nets over the edge. They'd get the tilapia and then they'd come in usually at dawn with their catch. And so Luke tells us, Pete has been fishing all night, hasn't caught a single tilapia. Do any of you have boyfriends or uncles or brothers or, or sisters or dads or moms who are fishermen, fisherwomen? Anybody? What are they like? Is it your husband? It's your son. Okay, you have to be really honest here. What's your name? Elijah? Elijah? Ooh, your mom and daddy named you right, son. That's a good name. Okay, Elijah, if you fish, let's just say you're fishing, I don't know, on the coast. Do you like to, to saltwater fish or freshwater fish? Freshwater. freshwater. Okay, so Percy Priest? Kind of, sort of, maybe. Okay, you're at, you're at someplace prettier. Um, uh, what's the one? Center Hill. You're at Center Hill and you're fishing. It's a super hot day and you fish for 12 hours and you don't catch anything. No brim, no nothing. Are you happy or are you grumpy when you come in? Grumpy. So thank you for your honesty, Elijah. So in my imagination, this is not in Holy Writ, but in my imagination, I always picture these stories as stories that are taking place because y'all, this is not a textbook. It's not a rule book. It's not a collection of benign morality tales. This is true. It really happened. At its core, scripture is a love story. Every story is redemptive, but this really happened. There really was a guy named Pete. He really did fish all night. He really did catch nothing. He really is on the shore the next morning. He's mending his nets because even though he didn't catch any fish, the net snagged on the boat. So he's ticked, mending his nets, probably in a bad mood, listening to Garth or Waylon, <laughs> something, mending his nets. Jesus comes walking up and Jesus goes, hey, Pete, I'm giving a devotion and the people in the back can't hear me because we live in the first century and have no AV systems, much less smoke. And so if I could use your boat, the water would amplify my voice and people in the back could hear me. Do you mind if I use your boat? I'm taking the tiniest bit of liberty with the Greek. New Testament was written in Greek, a little bit of Aramaic, but this is really close to what happened. And Pete says something along the lines of, sure, it hasn't been productive for fishing, so might as well use it for something that's halfway productive. And, and they put out a little from shore. Now, did Pete already know Jesus at this point? Y'all can talk back. He didn't know him as Messiah. He didn't know him as his savior. He knew who he was because you remember his little brother Andrew had already said, hey, Pete, I think this guy I just met, he's from Nazareth, his name is Yeshua. I think he's the Christ. I think he's the one we've been praying about for centuries. I think he is the son of Yahweh. And Pete said, Andrew, you are so gullible. You buy the Chia Pets off QVC. This guy, <laughs> the Christ, I mean, goodness gracious. He's from Nazareth. 200 people live in Nazareth. That's like smaller than Mount Juliet. There's no way he's the Messiah. 
Again, close to Holy Writ, not exactly the exact script, but this is the the context of the story. They put out a little bit from the shore. Jesus continues his devotion. Everybody can hear him now because the water's amplifying his, his voice. If you ever get a chance to go to Israel, you'll be stunned by there on the shore of Galilee, northern shores where about 85% of his recorded miracles took place. You can have somebody in the water and you can stand a football field up and you can hear him clear as a bell. It's just stunning, y'all. These stories happened. This is not a fable. So Jesus finishes his devotional. Everybody says batak, not batak, but batak, which Pastor Phil can tell you in Hebrew means we agree. We agree with what he just preached. And Pete's listening to all this and he's thinking, you know, this guy's pretty interesting. I don't think I'd play Angry Birds if he was my rabbi. I mean, when he talks, he's interesting. He prays as if he really knows Jehovah. This guy, this guy's pretty good. But then Jesus gets personal. And he says, Pete, how about we go out to the middle of the lake and we do a little fishing? Peter goes, (laughs) uh, Jesus, I mean, it sounds like you've done some online theology courses. I mean, you're, you're halfway decent about Torah, but you're obviously a city boy. Because you don't catch tilapia in the heat of the day. We've, we've got to do the oil lanterns. We've got to get insects going before the fish will come up. And Jesus goes, I'd, I'd still like to try. Peter goes, all right, city boy. And they push out to the middle of the lake. It's the heat of the day. And Jesus says, why don't you throw your nets to the right side of the boat? Y'all know the story. My mama was Baptist. My daddy was Assembly of God, so I'm Baptocostal. If you got any, any Baptist in you, you've seen this story, flannel graft. We know this story. <laughs> so you know that what happens next is the tilapia, they just start diving into the net. Y'all, you know, that, that goes completely against nature. That doesn't happen in the natural. So in that moment, this grizzled fisherman goes, oh, wow. Only God himself would have control over the natural world. There's no stinking way all those fish would catapult themselves into my nets unless he actually had authority over them. And in that moment, Pete realizes, my baby brother was right. This is the Christ. And he falls on his face in that boat. I always imagine just a little bit of dirty water, you know, maybe a few bait fish, just down there kind of in the dirt. And he says, don't, don't look at me, Jesus. I didn't believe I'm a, I'm a sinful man. And Jesus says, oh, Pete, get up. I'm not mad at you. I just want you to change your Facebook status. <laughs> You're gonna go from being a fisherman to a fisher of men. And after this first miraculous catch of fish, Pete spent three years right next to Jesus. Right next to Jesus, y'all. He didn't have to hear somebody preach about Jesus. He was with the Christ, one of the three closest to the Christ, Peter, James, and John. And this first miracle he witnessed paled next to the miracles he saw Jesus perform over the next three years. Do y'all remember a few? Y'all can talk back. Remember what Peter saw with his own eyes? What did he see? He saw the transfiguration, walked on water. He saw the transfiguration. You read that in Mark's gospel. It says Pete and Jesus and, and John and James went up a high mountain by themselves. That was on the Northern shore of the Sea of Galilee is where a lot of people think it was Mount Hermon. And all of a sudden, shazam, Jesus is transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's glowing. Do you remember who appeared on his right and his left? Moses and Elisha. Do you remember what is such a big deal about Moses and Elisha? They've been dead a really, really, really long time. (laughs) And all of a sudden they're next to Jesus. You know how Romans 8, 28 says that everything will work out for our good in God's glory. And sometimes people say that at really inopportune times, like when we're grieving with those who've lost somebody. And it makes Christians sound like we're just Pollyannas and we aren't really honest because they forget the beginning of that passage that says we will groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. In other words, this life can be really, really hard, but God is always, always good. Yo, the transfiguration proves that Romans 8, 28 is not hyperbolic. Everything ultimately will work out for our good. Does it bug any of y'all that Moses didn't make it in the promised land? 
I mean, if you're honest, we don't usually say that in small group Bible studies. Bugs the fire out of me because he was a good guy. I mean, apart from the murder rap, he was a really <laughs> good guy. And he leads those Israelites for 40 years and they get to the end of the wilderness wanderings and he gets mad and hits a rock. I would have been smacking Israelites. You know, by then there's, there's 3 million of them and they're so obnoxious. We wanna go back to Israel because we like the drive-throughs better. I mean, Egypt, we wanna go back to Egypt. It's like, oh my heavens to Betsy. All he does is smack a rock. And God says, you're not gonna make it into the promised land. You're gonna get buried on Nebo. That always bugged me. I know God's ways are above ours. But I thought, goodness gracious, if, if Moses didn't make it in, what chance does a hot mess woman like me have? And then there he is at the transfiguration. If we had Pastor Alex and Moses up here in Lazy Boys and we were doing a little redemptive Oprah this morning and Alex interviewed Moses and said, Moses, would you rather have gone into the promised land with three million sweaty ingrates or door number two, would you rather trust God with our story? Because he's not bound by time and space. And would you rather the first time you set foot in the promised land, you're next to a glorified Jesus and you can see the entire thing. Y'all, we get so bound by what we can see in here. We just get so bound by this and we forget, oh, he has always been redeeming. Peter saw that. Peter saw him walk on water. Peter saw Jesus go, Lazarus, come forth. Do you remember how long Lazarus had been dead? Three days. Because according to rabbinic tradition, they wouldn't pronounce someone dead until they'd been dead for three days because there had been some mistakes made in the past and people who were just like hungry because they were doing keto had fainted and they had pronounced them dead. It's from the devil. Jesus said he was the bread of life. Don't be doing keto. That's the only thing. I'm lying, I'm lying, it's good. It's all good. Gosh, sorry, Alex, you're gonna get emails from that. And then she said, and it was heresy. Keto is from Jesus, keep your keto. Anyway. Rabbi said, because we've made mistakes and pronounced people dead that weren't really dead, now you have to be dead for at least three days before we will actually pronounce you dead. Do you remember what Lazarus' sister said about him because he'd been in the grave for three days? It was great in the King James. He stinketh. He stinks. He is really, really dead. Peter is standing right next to Jesus when Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. Y'all, can you imagine? Nobody preached this to you. You didn't hear it on a podcast. You didn't watch it on TBN. You're standing next to him when Jesus says, Lazarus, come out of the grave. And a dead man comes out unwinding burial cloth. Pete saw all of that for three years. He was one of the three closest to Jesus. So when the going got tough, that man took him some territory right? No, no. When the going got tough, Pete fumbled the ball on the first yard line. When the going got tough, Pete was a yellow bellied sap sucker. When the going got tough, Pete betrayed the Christ. And y'all know that story. Even if you're a creaster and you only come to the belonging every Christmas and every Easter, you've heard this story. It's one of the more infamous stories in Christendom. We hear it all the time at Easter where Jesus is being hauled off and they're, they're taking him to be tried, an unjust trial, and they're gonna crucify him with common criminals outside the city. You know who they took outside the city? Dead bodies, sick bodies, lepers, diseased bodies. That's where our Jesus went. He took our shame outside the city. All that's coming. Peter, one of his three closest friends, Peter is so afraid of what the crowd is gonna think, so afraid of being oppressed along with Jesus. He says, I don't know the man. And then he throws in expletives, cuss words, so that the crowd will be convinced. Anybody who talks that trashy cannot be with the Christ. Through Jesus, under the bus. He's the biggest Benedict Arnold of scripture. He blew it. And he had no reason to blow it. Jesus had never been anything but kind to Peter. And a week and a half later, he encounters the Christ again. A lot happened in those 10 days. 
Jesus was crucified. We always hear there were nails in his hands, but if you actually study the original Greek, the nails were in his wrist because that, those bones are the bones that are strong enough to hold your body up on stakes on a cross. And they purposely positioned him below his hands so he would have to press up on the stakes in his feet to be able to breathe. And he's probably breathing acrid smoke from Gethsemane where they had burning trash all the time. And so he has to press up to breathe. He does that for us because he thinks we're worth it. And then he's put in a borrowed tomb for three days so that even the Jews would know he's dead, dead. He's really dead. If you ever wondered why he rose on the third day and not the second day, it's to prove he was really dead. And then on the third day, Mary from Magdala, a woman who had been oppressed by seven demons. Have you ever wondered why Luke is so specific about seven? Do you remember what the number seven denotes in biblical literature? Completion. Luke is explaining this woman is completely marginalized, completely oppressed. She's not just picked last for the team. She's never picked Mary from Magdala. You wouldn't let your son go to prom with her. And then Jesus visits Magdala and she encounters Jesus. And this woman who's not just marginalized, but as a woman in the first century, she has the same value as that of a good milk cow. Jesus says, who am I gonna choose? Out of all the people, who am I gonna choose for what is arguably the most important job in human history? And that's to be the first witness of my resurrection. I'll choose Mary, this woman nobody else would pick. So Mary's already said, sir, thinking Jesus was a gardener, if you could just tell me where you put him. I just wanna take care of his body. And Jesus said, Mary, it's me. All that has happened. Remember Mary ran back to the disciples, but the disciples didn't believe her because she was a woman and they think we are real emotional or something for I don't know why. <laughs> so the disciples didn't believe her and they were confused. So Peter saw the empty tomb, but he was really, really flustered. And he did what men have been doing, including Elijah since the beginning of human history. He decided to go fishing. Uh, John chapter 21, after this, Women go to the bathroom together, men go outside and kill things. <laughs> John chapter 21, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, same body of water, different title because of what was going, going on politically when John wrote his gospel account. And he revealed himself in this way, Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. I'm just discombobulated. I'm just, I don't really understand what's going on. And they said, we will go with you. Now y'all, that could preach for a year because it's only a week and a half after Peter has betrayed the Christ. He has not yet been through a 12-step program. He has not yet been mentored. As best we know, he hasn't even confessed yet. And the other 10, they've lost Judas by now, so they're down to 11. The other 10 say, we've got your back. Man, if only the church was more like that. We are so quick to kick people to the curb. It's stunning that they say, we'll go with you. We'll walk alongside you in your restoration. We'll go with you. They went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. What are they fishing for? Tilapia. How are they fishing for the tilapia? Cast net fishing. All night they caught nothing. The Yeti is empty, but just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, have y'all caught any fish? And Pete says, no, sir. None of them came up to the surface. Our coolers are empty. And Jesus, whom they don't yet recognize, says, throw your nets to the right side. And they throw their nets to the right side of the boat. And tilapia begin to catapult themselves into the net. 
I identify so much with Peter. I identify with him more than any of the other disciples because he just, he blew it so many times. And that's me. I mean, if every story in scripture was about some perfect person with a high metabolism, I would have a hard time. I love that God includes stories of people that have made huge mistakes, not to glorify sin, not to say sin isn't a big deal. Sin is a huge deal. Jesus could have just done detention if sin wasn't a big deal. He wouldn't have had to go to the cross, but his grace is greater still. When Peter throws the nets to the right side of the boat and the tilapia catapult themselves into the net, once again, the boat begins to sink. I think that slow to understand gentlemen went, This feels like deja vu to me. (laughs) Feels real familiar. Same exact lake, same exact spot, same exact circumstances. How kind is our God? He doesn't let us miss it. And in that moment, Peter realizes, it's the Christ. It's my savior, it's my king. And when I saw him 10 days ago, I threw him under the bus. When I saw him 10 days ago, I said I didn't even know him and I spoke with vulgar language because I was afraid they would crucify me too. Humanly speaking, what would be the next logical action for Peter? To jump out of the boat and swim in the opposite direction, right? To clean himself up before he comes back to the Christ he is so vulgarly and vehemently betrayed, but he doesn't, y'all. He jumps out of the boat. He does a Michael Phelps toward Jesus because he knows what he will find at the feet of Jesus is mercy. They share breakfast. Again, that's the kindness of our King. He swallows a fish fillet so Pete will realize this isn't a ghost. This is my Jesus. He really did resurrect bodily. And then they have a conversation and I bet you almost all of y'all have heard this conversation. It's very familiar in Christendom. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Pete says, Lord, you, you know me. You know that I love you. And Jesus says, then feed my sheep. And then a second time, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, his formal name, his IRS name, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know me. You know everything about me. You know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. Third time, seemingly the same question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know me. You know that I love you. And Jesus says, then feed my sheep. Why have y'all heard Jesus ask Pete that same question three times in a row? Yeah. Almost everybody has heard it's kind of a biblical quid pro quo that because Pete denied him three times, then Jesus restores him by asking the question three times. And that's part of the answer. That's not the best part. The best part is if you go back to the original language, they had the conversation in. There are three words in the Greek for love. There's eros, which is what we get the word erotica from, which I never experienced because I'm 58 and single. And then there's phileo, which means kind of a Facebook, Instagram kind of love. It's a It's a lateral love, a friend love can be a little bit or a lot. And then there's agapeo. And agapeo is the highest form of love in the Greek hierarchy because agapeo is a sacrificial love. It means that you love that person more than you love yourself. My guess is Bernie would say you agapeo Natalie. You'd say you agapeo Henry. You agapeo your kids. Um, First time I experienced what I think is close to agapeo is when I held my baby girl for the first time. I was in Haiti, her first mama had just died. Um, Her mama died of AIDS, she wasn't tested, didn't know, didn't know she had unwittingly passed on HIV to my little girl. Missy was really sick, she had tuberculosis and cholera and was really malnourished. And um, as soon as I stepped off the bus, they just shoved her in my arms. They were afraid as soon as I saw how sick she was, I would say, no, 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 I'm not up for this adoption. <clears throat> and I was holding my hands up because I didn't want her to be scared because she wasn't around, you know, that many big pale people. And they put her in my arms. She was two and a half and she was only 18 pounds. <laughs> she didn't like me at all very much. 
at first because, you know, it was just scary to her. I looked at her, just so sick, this tiny little Haitian peanut. And y'all, I thought, oh, I feel like my ribs are breaking. It's like my heart just expanded. I didn't know I could love that much. I was just like, stick a fork in me. I am done. The third time, the first time, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you agapeo me? Do you love me more than anything? And Peter says, Lord, you know me. You know what I did 10 days ago. You know, I threw you under the bus. You know, I phileo you. I love you like a buddy. The second time Jesus says to Peter, this is precious, mistake prone man, Simon, son of John, do you agapeo me? Do you love me more than anything? And it says that Peter was overwrought by the fact that Jesus was asking him the same question. In my imagination, I picture him just staring down at the sand. He's wearing khakis and an old Preds jersey, Bass Pro Shop hat. Helps me to think details like that because I've got to remind myself that this is a fiction, that this happened. That one day, after you and I see Jesus face to face and the psalmist says it'll be enough, we'll meet Peter and we'll be able to say, what was it like when you walked on water? We'll meet him. Picture him staring at the sand, covered with shame. His betrayal is still fresh in his mouth. It was a week and a half before. Lord, you know me. You know, the best I got is phileo. I, I am not a faithful man. I blew it. It got hard and I just blew it, Jesus. I didn't take any territory. I ran. I retreated. Third time. Third time. My imagination, not holy rip, my imagination is he takes that man's hand, face in his hands and he tilts, tilts his face so that they can have eye to eye contact and Jesus filled with compassion says to this mistake prone man, Simon, son of John, do you phileo me? He lowers the love bar for Peter. He says, I'm not kicking you off the team, Peter. I'm actually naming you team captain. I'm gonna build the whole New Testament church on your shoulders, not because of your capacity, but because of my compassion. I love you. I've never not loved you, Peter. My arms have always been open. When Pastor Henry and Pastor Alex told me that what God had laid on their heart for the future of the belonging is to take territory to trust God enough to take big steps. I began praying for y'all because you will never take territory based on enthusiasm. You will not take territory based on energy and inspiration. You will take territory based on gratitude. When you look back and go, I can't believe that at my very worst, he said, I'm worth it. I can't believe that he chose to stretch out his arms and he would have done it just for me. Pastor Henry is gonna close us and I know this is awkward and I know I'm a guest in your house. I haven't earned the right to be uh, this straightforward. But I walked bent for years because of shame. There was some betrayal and some abuse and some abandonment in my backstory and the gospel read like a fairy tale to me for years. I absolutely believed I needed to be delivered from my sins. I could not believe that a perfect and holy God delighted in me. So I labored with my head down for years. I was saved, but I wasn't free. And my gut says some of y'all are in that exact same spot because of a betrayal, uh, because of an abandonment. 
maybe by a father or a father figure, maybe by a church mentor, a church leader. My gut says, some of y'all, um, you're bringing everything you have to the table. You're just afraid to look up. You're afraid that God's other shoe is gonna drop and it's gonna be a shoe of discipline or a shoe of judgment. And it's hard for you to stand up and actually take territory because you don't trust 100% that his arms are open wide. He's not mad at you. He loves us more than we can possibly ask or imagine. May I ask you to stand? And Pastor Henry is just gonna take us where we need to go. Sometimes it's hard for us to fathom that God is for us, that he's for us. A friend, as Lisa said, God's never not been for you. He's never not been for you. It's hard for us to fathom that at our worst moments that God was still for us. And yet, before our worst moments, God was so for us that he sent his son Jesus knowing knowing what we were capable of. And yet still Jesus chose to endure the cross, to die, to rise again, so that we would not have to walk carrying the shame, the guilt, the sin, the penalty of that. And I sense here in this place this morning that there are people here in this room you have known about Jesus. You've been around religious things but you've never truly known the love of Jesus in a way that would transform your life, a way that leads you to walk in relationship rather than under the heavy burden of shame and guilt. And I'd love you if you would close your eyes across this room. If you're at home watching with us right now, just take a moment and close your eyes. We do this often in this church. We take a moment and pray and lead people to Jesus because we don't exist as a church to fill up a few hours on your Sunday and tell you things about God that is a part of it but what we're here to do is bring you to Jesus because religion can't change you a church service is going to point you in the right direction but it's nothing on this stage that's going to change you it's an encounter with the living God that comes through his son Jesus Christ the Bible says that 2,000 years ago Jesus who was the son of God is the son of God left heaven walked this earth died upon a cross rose again when he died on that cross he took the sin and the shame and the pain of all mankind upon himself because he knew for us the consequence was an eternity away from him and so Jesus stepped in to fill that gap Jesus stepped in to take upon himself that shame that sin that guilt so we would be seen as guiltless before a loving father and friend, here's the deal. You can know everything there is to know about Jesus, but it's not enough to know about Him. You've got to know Him personally. You don't know Jesus by default. It comes as an invitation. He's always waiting for an invitation. And today, I'd love to lead you in a prayer that is simply just an invitational conversation with Jesus, with the Father inviting Jesus into your life to be your Lord and your Saviour, to forgive you of your sin, to set you free of your past. Maybe it's the sin, it's the shame, it's the things of the past that you've been carrying around. Maybe you've never done this before, or maybe you once have, maybe you once walked with Jesus, but something happened along the way, things happened along the way, you feel like you let Him down, and so you weren't worthy any longer to be in His presence, that you weren't worthy any longer to call yourself a believer. Maybe you've believed the lies of the enemy that you're just not good enough. I wanna break that lie today in Jesus' Name. There is not one person on this earth that the love of Jesus cannot and has not already conquered that sin because of the power of the cross. It might sound like, man, this must be complicated. It must take a lot to get to that place of relationship with Jesus. Here's the thing, friends. Jesus has already done the hard work. All we've got to do is actually accept His invitation. 
to come before Him humbly and invite Him in as our Lord and Savior. And as eyes are closed across this room, I'd love to take a moment and lead you in a prayer. If you're here in this room, there's no one's looking around and you've never done this before. Maybe you've been around church, but you know that you've never invited Jesus into your life to forgive you of your sin, to save your soul, to give you an eternity with Him when you die and leave this planet. If that's you and you say today, Pastor Henry, I, I need to know Jesus like that. Would you lead me in that prayer? Would you lift your hand across this room? I believe there are dozens of people today that need to receive Jesus it's not enough just to be religious friend you might be here in the room or watching online but if that's you would you raise your hand maybe this is your first time maybe today you're saying I got to come back to Jesus but we're going to lead you in this prayer I'm telling you today is the day of salvation the Bible says if that's you I want to encourage you right now friend I want to pray this is the most important decision the most important moment in your whole life it's more important than anything you do. It's more important than who you marry. It's more important than what you think you're going to do with your future because when your future is in relationship with Jesus, everything else is changed. Thank you, friend. Thank you. It's worth it if there's just one hand, two hands, three hands. But I'm telling you today, friend, this is, this is a personal moment with Jesus. I believe He's drawing hearts. Thank you, friend. Thank you, friend. There's, there's, a, there's a powerful sense of the presence of God here in this room. I, I'd love to do something bold as we pray this prayer. I know there's several hands of people that are down the back of the room. But I would love to lead you in this prayer. I, I would love you if you would. Would you just slip out of your seat and come and meet me here at this altar? Because I believe God is about to change change everything for you would you would you come down here make your way if you didn't raise your hand but right now you know that God is stirring your heart come and meet me at this altar come and meet me at this altar I'm telling you God is doing things you might think man it's hard to get to we're gonna make way for you we're gonna make room for you we're gonna make space for you to come it's worth it if it's one it's worth it if it's two but I believe that there's more today come and meet me here at this altar come on if you were down the back come and meet me here at this altar I'm telling you I just want to wait a second because I believe that there are people that need to come. It's not my words you need to hear right now. It's the Holy Spirit. He's drawing hearts. He's drawing hearts. He's drawing hearts right now. I'm telling you, some of you have lived, you've lived with shame and you've never fully surrendered with Jesus because you've wondered if Jesus could ever really forgive you for what you've done or what you've experienced or what you've walked through. Friend, I want to tell you today, Shame is a lie. Oh, it's real. But it distorts how you see yourself. It distorts how you see your value. It distorts how you see your future. And I'm telling you today, if you've never fully surrendered your life to Jesus, you might have been around this, but you've never fully surrendered your life to Jesus because you've been carrying shame. I want you to get out of your seat. We're going to pray this prayer. I don't care if you've prayed this before. If you're still walking with shame, not fully understanding that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then we need to pray this prayer today. Because I believe the shame is going to lift. This might sound like simple words that we're going to pray, but I'm telling you, there's something supernatural, something divine, something powerful that happens when you call upon the name of Jesus. His name, the Bible says, is above every other name. It's above your sin. It's above your brokenness. It's above shame. It's above guilt. It's above your worst days, and it's even above your best days. Jesus is greater than all. And so as we pray this prayer, there's some people down the front here. Maybe you're watching online, but maybe you're out in the room right now, and you know that you need to pray this prayer. And friend, wherever you pray this prayer from, I'm telling you, God, He is it. Wherever you pray this prayer from, I want you to understand this. We're going to pray this together as a church. Blowing and you know how to pray this. So we're going to pray this together with our brothers and sisters, wherever they are. But I'm telling you, we're going to pray it loud. Not just to make physical noise. But I, it's, I, I believe we need to make some spiritual noise. We need to make some noise in the heavenlies because 
Every time we do this, I believe it's for people in the moment. And I also believe that we're prophesying into the future of people all over our city, of prophesying to people all over the internet, people in the building next door, wherever they are, we are prophesying. We are sending the Word out. Say, hey, if you're broken, if you're hurting, if you're stuck in shame, Jesus is your answer. He's your answer. He's your answer. So come on, we're going to pray this prayer together. I want you to pray this like your life depends on it because it literally does right now. So come on, every person, would you repeat this after me right now? Say, Father God, thank You that You sent Your Son Jesus to die on the cross for me. And Jesus, thank You that You rose again for me because You love me. Thank You that You rose again for me because You see me. Thank You that You rose again for me because You want to know me. So today, I surrender my life to You. I invite You in to be my Lord and my Saviour. Forgive me of my sin. Set me free of my past. In Your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, the Bible says that if just one prays that prayer, then all of heaven cuts loose. So come on, let's take a moment and praise God for every person that's prayed this prayer and received Jesus. I'm telling you, God's doing something powerful. And uh, I don't want to break this moment, but I would love us. Uh, we've got some of our team around you. They'd love to just take a couple minutes and pray with you, give you a Bible and uh, nothing crazy or anything like that. But we'd just love to take you out into the lobby where it's a little quieter. If you would, just follow Pastor Stephanie and uh, the church is going to celebrate you as you go. In Jesus' name. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer, there's going to be a link on the screen there. And we would love for you, uh, wherever you are across the world, click on that link. We would love to, uh, our team here in Nashville would love to pray with you stand with you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm telling you, shame's got to go. Shame has got to go. It's just, it's a burden. It's, it's baggage that you were never, you and I were never intended to carry the heavy baggage that is shame. We just weren't. We're not built for it. It, it will crush us. It will destroy us. It will trip us up and it will slow us down on the journey to where God has us. And so if you would, just one more time before we leave, just close your eyes across this room. Every person, lift your hands to heaven right now. Father, we just receive from your Holy Spirit. God, if there's any, if there's any bit of shame that's just hanging around still, we just speak to that right now and say, be gone. Father, if in any way we've come into agreement and allowed shame into our lives, through our actions, through our thoughts, through our words, through what we've done. And by not believing that You fully have already paid the price and set us free and delivered us from that. If there's anything that we've still walked with in agreement, we want to come out of agreement with that right now. We're just saying right now, shame, we come out, we step out of agreement. Just say that in your own words. Just say, shame, I'm leaving you behind. I'm leaving you. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not walking with you any longer. I'm closing the door. You're gone. You're done with. I might have done some bad things, but the blood of Jesus, the grace of Jesus has covered my sin so I'm not going to walk in this false guilt any longer I'm going to leave it I don't deserve it I know that I don't deserve it but thank you Jesus that you paid the price for me me who was undeserving of your love you were so gracious and kind because you love me and so I want to leave shame in the past I want to leave my junk in the past and I'm stepping I'm walking out of this place free in Jesus' name, I receive your love, I receive your grace, and I receive your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, just take a moment and let's give Him some praise today. Come on, if you believe that God can do it and He's done it, thank Him and praise Him. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I'm telling you, gratitude goes a long way. I love what Lisa was saying this morning, so many things. In fact, could we just take a moment and honour Pastor Lisa Harper for that word, but man. I, I, don't, I don't know how she did this because she preached two completely different messages that got to the exact same point in between the nine and the, I just, I don't even know, but it's just in her. I love, you know, I love it when someone's not trying to preach a message, they're just delivering their life because they're so rich in the world. Come on, one more time, let's honour Pastor Lisa Harbour.